Well, I'm very pleased this evening to uh, welcome you to the Department of Architecture, and uh, in particular, I feel very pleased to be introducing Leslie Wallace to you. Leslie Wallace uh, has a background in both architecture and engineering, and she joined the university um, two and a half years ago in order to undertake her master's degree in a subject which is called Interdisciplinary Design for the Built Environment. And given her background and her interest in um, interdisciplinary collaboration, she spent most of her time on the course focusing on how the different professions who have very different backgrounds, very different training, very different vocabulary, and very different values can work together. Um, she's been very well supported by her organization, a firm called Stantec, who are based in the States. They're a firm of 13,000 strong, and they offer consultancy services in energy, infrastructure, and construction. And uh, what she's going to tell us about is how that firm and um, the, the members of that firm have uh, worked together to deliver projects uh, successfully that uh, achieve this higher level of integration than uh, is typical in that sector. So, yes, opportunity to speak to you um, and I welcome you to this um, science festival talk as mentioned I have I'm a master's candidate in the part-time program of IDBE um, I recently completed my thesis and survived the VIVA exam oral examination um, on the topic of aspects of collaboration in multidisciplinary building design and construction firms. Now, that's really a mouthful, and tonight I'm going to sort of set some of those loftier ideas aside and talk simply with you about team working. Um, one of the things which uh, was alluded to in the introduction, as part of my thesis, I conducted a survey within my firm regarding teamwork, how it was used, how it was understood, and I'll pre tonight I'm going to present some excerpts from my research, my uh, study, and also some personal experience with you tonight. Um, I'm happy to take questions at various points throughout the presentation, and there will be time at the end as well. So we may think of teamwork just happening, but there are actually scientific explanations for what goes on in teams. Um, in its purest form, teamwork is studied within the social sciences. Uh, for example, behavioral science or organizational science. However, it's a subject of concern for other fields. For example, in public administration, which in, um, involves the development and implement, implementation excuse me, of government policy, teams may consist of those involved uh, in developing the, pro the policy or those who may be affected by it. In my own field of building, um, teams are composed of various <coughs> professionals, architects, engineers, constructors, each which have specific aims and requirements for the building. And a new practice emerging um, in medicine is the idea of interdisciplinary uh, practice which, where specialized pr practitioners work together to meet the holistic care needs of the patient or to treat complex health problems. <coughs> My research uncovered 48 aspects of teamwork. During our time here this evening, I have chosen to talk about eight of those, which I think are most applicable to any and all teams. The aspects covered in this presentation are common aim, open dialogue, team spirit, 
all contribute, problem solving, uh, mutual trust and respect, non-adversarial, and win-win outcome. I, I will explain the characteristics of each of these aspects and talk about why they are important, how to develop them, and some of the pitfalls that may be encountered. I also have some examples of research in these areas or real, real life applications to share. So let's take a first uh, look at our first aspect, common aim. The common aim is shared by all team members. What, what does this mean? A common mutual or shared goal is an essential characteristic of teamwork. Teams get together to achieve something. This needs to be an agreed upon objective. And it seems simple, yet it's possible for the common aim not to be commonly held or understood by the team members. The first, uh, the first step to a successful team is to clearly identify the goal, the <coughs> objective. Put, and possessing a common aim is not enough just um, for teamwork to take place. Team members have to intend to act or decide in their work. They must agree to do something towards the goal, towards the objective. <clears throat> the action must focus on a problem, a project, or some other effort. Collective vision is commonly held, is a commonly held view of the goal and how to get there. And as mentioned above, some difficulties may arise uh, on arriving at a shared vision. This is often because team members come from different backgrounds, they have different views, um, they may have had different experiences or even different uh, ideas about the problem or the project. To overcome these differences requires a high level of commitment. Um, these differences can be resolved through communication and negotiation and keeping the goal always in sight. The teams work together to achieve the aim. Any individuals or groups within the aim um, are called stakeholders. And this is kind of a technical term, but I want to focus on who the stakeholders are within any team effort. Sometimes the stakeholders are members of the team. Well, actually, they always are members of the team. Or the team members are always stakeholders. So let's get that straight here. Um, but there may be others who we could consider stakeholders who have an interest in the effort, the project, the goal, that are not actually members of the team. Um, they may be waiting on the sidelines to receive the puzzle as it's completed. They may have a use for it. They may have information that be, may be necessary in putting it all together. But they may not actually be members of the team. Sometimes um, <coughs> these absent stakeholders can have an effect upon the uh, actions, the intentions, the outcome of the team. For example, um, in architecture, a building user may have uh, information about how they use the space, how they function in it, how they live in the house. Um, if this is withheld um, and the knowledge is not presented to the team, the building design may not accommodate that use. Another example of um, absent stakeholders is considering things like uh, government policy. Um, many times the people who are affected by the policy are not present in the meetings to develop or involved in the implementation of it, but yet they are affected by these decisions. 
So before I move on to the next aspect, um, I just thought I would pause and see if there are any questions in regard to the common aim. All right, thank you. So the number two on my list for tonight is open dialogue. An environment of open dialogue exists um, between all team members. Open dialogue refers to communication. In teamwork, communication is the primary means of exchange. Uh, um, the work of the team, the ideas are conveyed verbally. They may be conveyed in written form. But communication is the primary means of exchange. So the, first of all, the flow of communication must be multi-directional. And by this I mean that it goes back and forth. Um, it is not just one way as one person you know, telling the others what to do. But the communication must go back and forth where both sides share ideas and give feedback. The communication may be both formal and informal. And by formal, we mean occurring at meetings or uh, specified settings for the team to gather and discuss the ideas. Informal mm -hmm. refers to the communication that happens when team members are away from these organized settings, the conversations that they have um, when they're not within the formal setting. Both formal and informal communication have an impact on the team, on what the team does and how they can accomplish their goal. Such, such communication is not only interactive and dynamic, but it's also, it also may evolve. Team members, as they work together, may find new ways of communicating that work best for them, that work best for the people involved, or the project that they happen to be working on. Finally, to, um, to avoid pitfalls in communication, it's important that this be an open-ended approach. So any communication between team members um, should have uh, should not occur with any preconceptions in mind. There should be, prejudice should be withheld. And team members should also allow questioning and modification of ideas. Um, it's, you know, when you're having a conversation, that feedback is important for things that you um, are trying to say to make sure the message is delivered and to make sure that the message is understood. So here I have uh, four diagrams which uh, describe some different scenarios of communication. Um, the circles represent people, and the lines between them represent the conversation or the communication that's taking place. At the top left, we have two people. And, you know, this is. Um, they engage in conversation, uh, which is represented by the black line. This is a direct exchange. So at the top right, we now have three people involved. And we can say that our team is growing. And yet at this point, it's easy for them to converse with one another. They have just two other people to, keep, to share their ideas with. At the bottom left, we now have four people in this team. And the communication becomes a little bit more <coughs> complex. It requires a little bit more effort, as represented by the increasing number of lines between these. Each person now has to communicate with three other people. And finally, this last example, where we have five, you can see again how much the communication um, has intensified and a lot more um, lines means a lot more back and forth, a lot more discussion, meaning you know more effort there. 
to illustrate why making the effort to communicate with all team members it's important, uh, is important, let's look at this diagram in another way. Um, have you ever played a game called Gossip? Or some people call it Telephone? I remember it from my childhood, and it was a great example that I thought of to explain this. So a group of people sit in a circle, and one person starts by whispering something, a story or a statement, to the person next to them, who then passes it on to the person next, and on around the circle until it comes back to the beginning. Well, by this time, the message is compared with what was originally said, sometimes to great amusement. So in a team, this type of communication can uh, distort the message quite easily. So by the time the message gets to the end of the circle or around the circle, it's completely different than what it was to begin with. So, the message becomes more important that we share it across the circle. And so, each team member must make an effort to communicate with all of the other team members. And this is not just a one-way communication. It's not just sharing the idea, but it's also receiving the feedback. So, any questions on this? All right, thank you. So, moving on to the third aspect, which I want to share tonight. Team spirit exists between all team members. Team members come together for a variety of reasons. At the beginning, team members may have a shared, differing, or even opposing interests in this objective. And these may change or be redefined as the team works together. As such, the team members are dependent upon one another to achieve the goal. And awareness of this dependence, or a connection if you will, leads to a sense of belonging, um, it leads to mutual knowledge of values, and it is represented by the need and desire for interaction and engagement. People must be open and clear <coughs> about their own interests and discussing them in a cooperative search for answers that give everyone what they need. Team spirit comes from finding unity through shared interests and turning differences into commonalities. <coughs> I'd like to relate a personal experience regarding team spirit on, on a project um, for the renovation of two secondary schools. To briefly set the stage, I will tell you that there were three project goals um, that everyone agreed with. The aim was to provide, um, make, provide a better environment in the school, to make it more comfortable for the pupils. I mean, and who could argue with such a, uh, you know, an idea that we would deny making a school a more comfortable place? So this here, we have the team that were responsible um, for achieving these three goals. And as you can see, the list is kind of long and varied, and it includes 14 people who were qualified in their respective professions, and each <coughs> one represented a separate company. So what could stand in the way of these 14 highly qualified professionals in achieving their three project goals? Well, self-interest. Self-interest can get in the way. In addition to their role on the project team, each person had a role in their company. Um, 
the, and their primary responsibility typically within their company was to see that the work was done as planned and scheduled so each company could make money by doing, um, fulfilling your tasks on time. That's <coughs> the common way that we make money in the building industry. Very simplified, but that's how it works. <coughs> also, you have individual personalities um, who see the project in different ways. They may have done, um, you know, projects like this before, and they think they know how it should be done. Or someone may be of a mind to be um, to innovate, and let's try something new on this project. So. It is possible that self-interest could have derailed this project. So how did this team manage to achieve the goals? They were very open and honest about their obligations. Um, they talked about different approaches to the project and how those approaches would affect each team member and the company that they represented. In the end, by working together, they were able to coordinate everyone's needs and to achieve the project goals of building better schools, and they achieved the company goals of making money for each and every organization. <coughs> Going on to our fourth point, um, I want to share with you this aspect where all team members contribute to the effort. The ability for everyone to contribute is controlled by the atmosphere within the team. There must be equality. Participation, power, and decision making should be equitably shared in teams. Equity is characterized by a lack of authoritative stru structure or hierarchy. This means that every team member has direct responsibility for the actions and decisions <coughs> of the team. They also must impose decisions on themselves. Another characteristic of equity is a willingness to accept that all team members have a valid interest and that the outcome of their work should reflect this. When it comes to the actual work of the team, coordination and organization are necessary. Team members need to communicate about tasks. They should both anticipate and decide what needs to be done, by whom and when. Often the tasks are connected and planning helps the team to work together. Additionally, if everyone is aware of what needs to happen, they are more able to assist one another. And this um, is an, an, a very good feature of teams in that team members can be there to help one another. Teams can be thought of networks, and science now identifies self-organizing networks as the most robust and effective form of organization for living things, including human organizations. Such organizations shape and reshape themselves in response to complex patterns of feedback and initiatives. To illustrate this, um, and how it might occur, I'm going to turn to the emerging practice in medical teams. Some medical conditions are very complex and require teams of specialized physicians to properly diagnose and treat the patient. These doctors are each trained to look for specific symptoms um, according to their speciality. And then following on those symptoms, there are certain procedures which are recognized and recommended for treatment of that condition. When working as a team, they must consult with each other 
to ensure that the treatment that they are proposing doesn't interfere with um, either another condition observed or another treatment that a different physician is proposing. They must organize this method among themselves because the conditions can vary. You know, we can have uh, someone specialized in art, someone specialized in diabetes, maybe um, a specialist, a dietitian, all working together to help this patient. Um, also, there's a concept of treating the whole patient. This is another approach where the methods for accomplishing this also involved a team of physicians with various specialties. So moving on then to the fifth aspect, um, of problem solving and the, the team um, team working creates this environment of problem solving, a setting for it to take place. <coughs> Combining knowledge enables the teams to find the most <coughs> favorable solution. This is cited as one of the greatest benefits of team working. By using different team members' perspectives and insights, the team can explore a wide range of information and solutions. Sharing the information enables the participants to comprehend, critique, adopt, or debate, incorporate um, ideas from other team members. Teams that work well together typically are more effective and innovative. Teamwork supports creativity. Working together allows team members to achieve more than they could alone. And this is something which we um, call synergy. <coughs> A very good use of team, uh, team <coughs> efforts is to take these different perspectives and to find unifiers amongst them. Um, those are the, those are the uh, full solutions, the most desirable solution that is being looked for. Um, and again, as I mentioned, this is cited as one of the benefits of team working, is that we can take all of these individuals who may have a different idea, different perspective, different outlook on the aim, goals, problem, whatever it might be that they're working towards, um, and, can, and we can use that to resolve it. Team members need to talk through, because sometimes these perspectives may not be <coughs> in alignment. They may be very different as to seem almost in opposition. Um, but again, this um, is a time for the team to comprehend, critique, or adopt. Sometimes it's helpful to um, list these perspectives in terms of priorities. <coughs> but the goal is to achieve a result that is greater than what the individuals may have come up with on their own. Synergy is that extra something that comes as a result of the team efforts. You take one person and add another to the team, and somehow the end result is much greater than you thought possible. Um, in good teams, one plus one does equal three. Um, or maybe we should say two star, or however you want to define it. Um, whatever goes into the team, um, their work, it grows and it comes out better for the effort. Our sixth aspect is an environment, an environment of mutual trust exists between all team members. Trust and related factors are more helpful to team working than other factors. Trust and respect take time to develop. Trust may initially exist uh, contingently, something described as, I will if you will. This is a 
basic form of give and take. And such relationships must, be, must evolve to more sophisticated levels of trust and respect so that team members give without thought of taking. All team members are treated equally. And as the team members work together, they develop confidence in one another. And, the, and respect then comes from these demonstrated capabilities. And as stated before, it takes time for these things to develop, but the benefits are great. So I have two examples of where trust fits into teamwork. This first example, um, you don't have to take in this whole table. What I wanted to point out though is here on the right hand side, um, this, is a, this is a process for one of the many processes for team working. And they identified four human behaviors which are um, 